Over the course of our species history, humans have colonized essentially every pocket of the world. And when we look at the tremendous diversity that's apparent in humans today, it becomes clear that natural selection has acted to shape our species, allowing us to adapt to the challenges that we face in these new environments and contexts. However, there's still very few elucidated cases of human adaptive variation. And here we're going to tell you two stories. In the first, we're going to tell you how we look for genetic signatures of natural selection in the human DNA code. And in the second, we're going to tell you how we've pursued one of our most promising candidates, a variant of the ectodysplasin receptor, in order to decipher its biological effects in vivo. Now, in the genome era, we have uncovered many hundreds of regions with evidence of natural selection, but uncovering the underlying adaptive mutation has proven to be much more difficult. That's because the regions are large and contain many thousands of variants, and without a prior hypothesis of an adaptive trait, it is difficult to know where to begin. This is made even more difficult by the fact that up until now, we haven't had the full sequence data necessary to examine every variant in the region. With this challenge in mind, we previously developed a method called the composite of multiple signals. It was designed to pinpoint a small number of variants that we could pursue. And with the completion of the pilot phase of the Thousand Genomes Project, we can now examine the vast majority of nucleotides in the genome for evidence of recent evolution. In doing so, we identified potential adaptive coding mutations, as well as many mutations in regulatory regions and non-coding RNAs, and those associated with a variety of human phenotypes. In order to ultimately validate and understand an adaptive mutation, we must show that it confers some sort of a phenotype, a change that could be the target of natural selection. We pursued one of the most interesting candidates from our selection scan, an immune acid change in the toll-like receptor TLR5, a molecule that's important for the human immune response to flagellated bacteria. And through our experiments, we do indeed show that this particular mutation in TLR5 does indeed lead to a difference in nf kappa v signaling in response to flagellin. Given the importance of this signaling pathway in the human immune system, it is possible that this particular change might lead to a difference in the way that carriers respond to certain bacterial infections. This first study shows the critical first part, which is to carry out a genome scan, identify individual mutations, find out which one of those might be biologically meaningful, and then validate to try to get individual mutations that may be important in human evolution. And that's when the fun begins, because in order to really prove that and to understand how a trait might affect human survival, you need to come from a multidisciplinary approach. One of the most intriguing candidates of human natural selection is a single base change in the gene that encodes the ectodysplasin receptor EDAR. Now this particular change results in a valine to alanine substitution at residue 370 in the encoded EDAR protein. Now by our scans, this variant, called EDAR370A, showed one of the strongest signals of selection in the human genome. To understand the evolutionary context in which EDAR370A arose, we carried out computational analysis and found that the likely origin for EDAR370A is in central China roughly 30,000 years ago. To understand the functional significance of EDAR370A, we turned to a classic genetic model, the inbred mouse. Now the reason we did this is that there is a long history establishing that EDAR is critical for the formation of ectodermally derived organs like skin and teeth and hair in mammals. And so we reasoned that a mouse model in which we replace the valine that's normally found at position 370 of mouse EDAR with the alanine that's under selection in humans, that this mouse would accurately tell us what are the biological effects of the selected EDAR variant. What we found was really exciting. Our EDAR 370A mouse had thicker coat hairs, a number of mammary tissue changes, and an increased number of eccrine sweat glands. Now this is very exciting, and the reason it's exciting is because it's providing us with a critical piece of evidence that EDAR 370A could have been acted on by natural selection. Because what the mouse is telling us is, this single amino acid substitution is alone able to change multiple traits at the level of a whole organism. Our results in the mouse indicate that the same target organs will be affected by the EDAR allele in humans. And to evaluate this, we went to China to carry out an association study where the story of EDAR originally began. We came to the Taizhou cohort in China and began to investigate the traits of sweat and hair 
in the populations where the mutation likely originated. What was very striking was that just as in the mouse, individuals who had two copies of the EDAR370 allele had a higher number of active eccrine glands than individuals with only a single copy. Our results with EDAR370 suggest several possibilities as to why this variant could have been under selection. One possibility is that EDAR370 arose as part of a thermoregulatory adaptation given the increase in eccrine sweat gland number. On the other hand, given that there are multiple effects downstream of this variant, we could also say that perhaps multiple selective forces have acted on EDAR 370A over the course of its rather long evolutionary history. So in a sense, we're still at the beginning, but it's a very solid beginning and a foundation on which we can build testable hypotheses. And we got here by bringing people together from many different fields. For example, I'm a computational geneticist developing scans to detect natural selection. My name is Dan Lieberman. I'm a human evolutionary biologist. I am Li Jing. I'm a population geneticist. I'm Bruce Morgan. I'm a developmental biologist. I'm Cliff Tabin. I'm a developmental biologist. I'm Mark Thomas and I'm an evolutionary geneticist. So this is a very exciting time for human evolutionary biology. Advances in computational population genetics and human association studies, as well as the power of established mouse models and in vitro assays, are making it possible for us to translate human genomic complexity into adaptive variation.